Coach Phil Tran, how are you doing, buddy? I'm doing very well. Happy to be on the program. Well, um, you know, for the audience, this is a former teammate of mine at, at Baylor University back in 2003, four. I think you graduated in five, maybe, uh, Phil. And I grad I graduated in December of '04 with my bachelor's degree at the age of 20, but they told me I could keep playing college football if I stuck around for a master's. So I got my master's degree in May of 2006 at the age of 22. There you go. Well, you got it done quickly, man. And that's uh, that actually propels us right into our first question, man. You, you, that first degree that you got, you didn't mention that it was a poli sci degree, all right. Then you got your sports management um, masters. You, you got that at the age of twenty two, and then you even earned a JD from Syracuse afterwards. And you still managed to find your way back on the gridiron after all those uh, accolades in the classroom. You know, what is your reason? What was the attraction uh, to, to to becoming a football coach? I grew up playing football and um, played Texas high school football at the 6A level. Uh, my, back then, it, we all had 5A. It was 6-man and then 5A before Texas high school football bumped 6A, um, excuse me, 6-man football into 1A and made 5A, 6A. So right. just to make sure everyone's on the same page, I played in what is now a 6A high school football program in Texas. And as you all know, uh, Mario Price is a great teammate and dear friend of mine at Baylor University. Playing college football was a very impactful and indelible experience in my life. At the same time, though, I do have interests off the field. And growing up, I had a great skill for public speaking and a knowledge for public policy. So you all may be familiar with the class superlatives that they hand out in high school. I was tagged as, quote unquote, most likely to be president. <laughs> so I say that because my life and my background has informed me very well as to how I should approach kids. So what's truly my passion is coaching football and also coaching other sports on the field, being an inspiration to kids, making an impact in their lives and being a positive influence. That in mind, when folks start tagging you as most likely to be president or most likely to be a millionaire or all other fun class superlatives like that, but they go beyond, and then you have teachers looking at you saying, I can't wait to vote for you someday, or teachers saying, I'm going to be working for you someday. When you are a very young and impressionable high schooler, you start to feel a little bit of that burden, like you have the weight of your community on your shoulders, and you have to fulfill their dreams and their ambitions for you so that you can please them and make them proud. So I studied political science. The master's degree was in sport management was basically the degree program at the graduate level that they steered all the early graduates right. from Baylor athletics into because it was, it's a good program, but it's also a program designed for student athletes. Right. But then I went to law school because it was more or less just a check the box operation. Lots of folks worked in politics who have law degrees, so I figured just check the box. Don't do anything in life just to check the box. You do it if it's truly a passion of yours. Now I was able to get through law school in two and a half years although my grades at law school weren't anywhere close to my grades at Baylor University in my undergrad or graduate program. But praise the Lord, I got through in two and a half years, got out that experience. I spent a little bit of time in the D.C. area working in government and politics. And then in February of 2010, an opportunity presented itself for me to return to the game of football. Thankfully, in the D.C., Maryland, and Virginia area, you do not need to have a teaching certificate to be a coach on the field. 
I understand that that's not the case all across the nation. I know in Texas specifically, if you want to coach in the public schools in Texas, you do need to be teacher certified. While in Texas, I am aware that the path to alternate teacher certification is through pretty easy. It's not easy in the D.C., Maryland, and Virginia area if you want to become a teacher after the fact. Right. However, uh, you don't need to have a teaching certificate to coach on the field. So that provided me with an entry point into the public schools. I got my start coaching high school football at West Springfield High School in Fairfax County, Virginia, just right outside of D.C. And it was an awesome experience. I wanted to return to the game of football because the game is in my blood. It's a very, it's a very indelible experience in my life. I've been greatly blessed with some amazing experiences so that I can be a blessing to others. Originally, when I wanted to go back into football as a coach, I think like all other folks who made a career switch and returned to football, we do miss the game. But as my years of experience have accumulated, my role on the field has taken much more of a deeper meaning. And I'm here to inspire, influence, and impact others so that they can be the best athletes they can be and have a successful life from here on out. Coach, that's awesome, man. Uh, great to see you find your way back to the field. Uh, clearly, I can see the passion that you, that you hold for that for that job. You know, not quite the president, uh, but more, you know, more impactful. You know, are just as impactful, and that that's uh, phenomenal. Now, let's talk about the American Football Coach Association real quick. Uh, you know, I, I've, I've had the opportunity to kind of talk to you since, I mean, heck, since we got through playing football, and um, you know, as I as I transitioned into this role at the AFCA, you all, you, you know, one of our first conversations that we ever had was how important the AFCA has been to you in your career, and uh, you've been a member since two thousand and seven. I want to say you've been to most conventions since that point in time. You know, how did you, as, especially as a young coach, because actually my, my career path wasn't as similar. I knew I wanted to coach, so I hopped into coaching ASAP. But I didn't join the AFCA until a couple of years of, uh, um, you know, actually coaching and somebody said, hey, man, you need to get down here. And it just happened to be in Dallas, uh, my first one going to, just because it was local. Um, you know, you almost immediately start going to this as you uh, – <laughs> as, as That you, is correct. As you got into the into the profession, almost even before that point, Tom. So uh, – Yes, sir. How did you – Learn about the AFCA and how has it assisted your growth? When I was finishing up my time at Baylor University, I knew I had the coaching bug in me. And while I did take some time to pursue some other interests of which I have a great talent, I knew that one day I wanted to try to find my way back onto the football field just so that I can experience having football in my life again and give back to this great game. I met individually with four of our Baylor football coaches to talk about my future and what my prospects were for coaching football. That would be Guy Morris, our head coach, Gerald Carr, our assistant head coach and running backs coach, and Chris Lancaster, our offensive line coach, and crime dog, Wesley McGriff, our defensive backs coach. And I was very grateful that they spent their time to talk with me in depth about my goals, my ambitions, and what certain pitfalls may arise as I continue to progress. And they all shared the same exact sentiment. They said that, you're, Bill Tran, you are a great player, but you can be an even greater coach. So that was the consensus among all the coaches. and. Each one of them gave me some very valuable insights by telling their own personal stories, which are very different as to how they got to the point that they are today, what they would have done differently, what challenges that I need to be aware of as I move forward. I know that Coach Morris and Coach Carr did tell me that if I wanted to be a college football coach, I have to be prepared to be a nomad. And if you look at the resumes of a lot of college football coaches out there, most of them 
were nomads in their 20s, in their 30s, sometimes going into their late 30s and early 40s, just trying to land that long-term job at a big program. And for me, I'm quite the homebody by nature. (laughs) And the idea of moving all across the country to coach at all these different schools for the better part of my young adult life just did not sound that appealing to me. And when I look at my own high school coaching resume, I actually have coached at quite a bit of schools in the past 12 years. That would be seven high schools under nine different head coaches. However, I did not have to change my residence. All I needed to do was change my commute as a high school football coach, which was much, much better for my own lifestyle preferences. Additionally, Coach Carr, Gerald Carr, gave me this one valuable piece of advice. He told me, Phil, first thing you need to do if you want to be a football coach is to sign up for the AFCA convention, become a member, and attend the annual convention. And he told me that there is an upcoming convention in San Antonio, I believe, in January of 2007. So I made my way to San Antonio for my first ever AFCA convention in 2007. It was a bit of an overwhelming experience when you are a very young um, aspiring coach because at the time I was in law school and I did not have a coaching gig. And I will tell all young coaches out there that it is normal to feel overwhelmed when you first set foot in the AFCA convention as a first timer. And for the folks who are listening to this program right now and not seeing me in person, let me just tell you all that I quote unquote don't look the part. I was deemed the smallest college football player in the Big 12 Conference during my time. They actually did a newspaper article on me at the Waco Tribune Herald. They did a little bit of digging, and they found that that the second smallest player in the Big 12 Conference during my time was at Texas A&M. He was five foot four, 140 pounds. I was officially listed at five foot three, 137 pounds. <laughs> Is the so moment. I so I don't look the part. And while not looking the part has never intimidated me from pursuing my dreams as a player on the gridiron, when you transition into being a football coach and you're walking around the convention floor without a job, just trying to meet people and learn as much as you can, it can feel a bit overwhelming and a bit intimidating. And I'll tell all the young coaches that that's a normal feeling. As a much more experienced coach today, I remember what it was like to be a young coach like that, and I make it a point to be open and accessible to as many coaches as possible. So my message to all the coaches out there is that if you run into me at the next AFCA convention and I'm not preoccupied with talking with an old friend or deep into some business discussion, feel free to walk on up, introduce yourself to me, and let's talk about football and life. I want to make myself open and inviting to everyone and let everyone know that the AFCA is a very welcoming and inviting professional association. We are all here to help you all be the best coaches you can be. Coach, that was awesome, man, because I, you know, I think we're on episode maybe 200 coming up here in the next few weeks. And over 200 episodes, I've, I've had several guys talk about their experience at the convention. And somehow, once every few episodes, we talk about that first-time experience. And I think it, it it's pretty standard that you walk in there and you're overwhelmed with the amount of coaches that are in this industry. Um, the, 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 the competitiveness of the, the coaching world, you know, trying to get that next gig. And, and that first time, you're almost like, man, can I survive? Can I make it in this industry? Look at all these guys, you know, and you're walking by the guys that you see on TV coaching on the sidelines and you're just, like you said, overwhelmed. That's, that's such a good word. But what's so special, not only about 
the profession, but about the American Football Coaches Association is that after we have these opportunities to to go and be overwhelmed, you know, there's tons of coaches like you and myself and, you know, tons of guys that mentor me and mentored you uh, that, that are open and willing to help guide and assist and, uh, you know, uh, just just lead you on that journey. So, you, you know, that 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 overwhelming is not that overwhelming feeling is definitely natural for the first convention. But uh, the amount of coaches that's willing to open their arms and, and, and help you out and point you in the right direction and give you advice, man, is is great. Now, you know, not only have you attended, you know, to o- o- over 10 AFCA conventions and been a member since 2007, um, you, you've had the opportunity to contribute. It's been important to you to contribute. Obviously, you're on a podcast now. Um, you did a speaking session um, at the in-person convention. You, you, you provided us a piece at, for our virtual convention, convention on special teams play. Um, and, and, and you also wrote an article on us about uh, ball security, uh, or article force, excuse me. About, about running back play, why is it important uh, to contribute, you know, not just be a member, be an active member of the American Football Coaches Association? And, uh, you know, you, you just kind of said it a second ago, and, and, and maybe you can reiterate it. Why is it important to pay it for, you know, to give back to this great gang? I believe that once coaches accumulate useful knowledge and experience, we owe it to the profession and to – younger coaches to give back and share our knowledge. This is how we continue to push the industry forward. This is how we continue to innovate. Additionally, when you are coaching on the field, you can't reach every single kid. We know this. You can't reach every single kid. You try to touch as many lives as you can. But you can't reach every single kid, and you definitely can't reach the kids who you are not coaching, who are playing at other schools, who are playing at other schools and teams on the other side of the country. If you really want to extend your influence and your impact, you have to coach the coaches. I'm a very devout Christian of the Catholic tradition. And for those who speak Christianese, this is about making disciples to make disciples. Jesus Christ had his 12, and his 12 made other disciples, and those disciples made other disciples. And then before you know it, there was a worldwide movement, and Christianity became the most dominant, influential religion in the history of the world. Let's take it back to coaching. If you really want to in, expand your influence and your impact, you have to coach the coaches. Coach some other coach about your system, about your philosophy, and that coach can take your system and your philosophy, innovate on top of that with their own personal style and their own personal experiences. And that's how you pay it for. That's how you expand your influence and your impact. I believe it is important for us to give back to the profession for those reasons. Absolutely, man. It, it, that that response kind of t- takes me back a little bit to twenty uh, late 2016. I got a call from Todd Berry, who was – our executive director now, um, who in my life has been very impactful. Number one, I got my first Division One opportunity to be an assistant coach for him. Uh, I got my opportunity to play Division One football, my first opportunity to play for him at the United States Military Academy at West Point back in 2001. He walked into my house and uh, gave me that opportunity. So I've known him for a long time, and in 2016 he offers me an opportunity to, you know, come and, and work at the American Football Coaches Association. And I was – I was so in love, not not just with the X's and O's and the schematics and the the brotherhood of a coaching staff, but just being able to pour into a group of, you know, ten to fifteen wide receivers or running backs, and uh, you know, just just, just the power of influence of, of coaching. And I I remember when he called, I was like, man, this is such a good opportunity. You know, the nomadic lifestyle. I had four or five jobs in about six or seven years, and kind of kind of moved all over the south. And uh, it was an opportunity for some stability financially and, and, and locationally and all that kind of stuff. And I sat there and I, I, I literally kind of went through what you just said. I was like, yeah, I'm going to miss the opportunity to influence my 10 or 15 a year. You know, obviously it goes beyond just the guys that are in your room. But 
I can I, I can indirectly impact so many more, uh, you know, just by you know coaching the coaches, giving back my knowledge and, and helping uh, the knowledge sharing uh, in, in this great community. So um, you're exactly right, man. It, it's it's such yes, a powerful sir. opportunity to be able to kind of kind of spread what you've learned and, and, and put it into other coaches and let it pour into their young people. And it just kind of keeps your Mario. I've go ahead, Mario. I've mentioned this to you before, and it is worth repeating and reiterating to our audience today. The AFCA has been the single most important mentor in my coaching career, and the AFCA can also take credit for helping me find my last two high school football coaching jobs. The conversations that you develop with coaches. In the hallway, on the convention floor, in the breakout rooms, in the hotels, in the restaurants, are opportunities for you to informally interview for jobs. And when the time came for me to make a move to my next destination, I slid right on into my next destination without an issue. It was like I already had the job before I even interviewed for it. And that was because I laid the groundwork at the AFCA convention. Coaches, you are always being interviewed. Keep that in mind and comport yourselves accordingly. Phil, thanks for sharing that, man. I, I've, I kind of feel like we're, we're an AFCA commercial, but it was so important that I ask some of these questions to you because you're, you're right. We've had some of these conversations before about how important this association has been to you. So I want to make sure that we ask those questions. And um, now to get a little bit back into your journey a little bit, you, you just said the statement that you <laughs> that that you got a couple jobs at the AFCA and, you, and, you, and you're thankful for us. But the reality of it is you, you've you you've done something that a lot of coaches really haven't. Um, you made yourself a, a lot more marketable, not by your um, – versatility and coaching different positions on the football field. Uh, not only that, I mean, because you you are you also have done that, but uh, your versatility just to coach, especially at the high school level, other sports and, uh, you know, be involved in strength and conditioning. You, 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 uh, you coach ice hockey, <laughs> whatever that yes, is. Sir. I'm a Texas guy, so I don't even know what ice hockey is. I'm just kidding. Don't let this Texas boy <laughs> fool you. I know a little bit about ice hockey, just a little bit. Uh, you know, uh, swimming, uh, once again, strength and conditioning. You, you transitioned from being a running back coach to being a specialist coach and, uh, you know, know the ins and outs of deep snap and holding, kicking, all that kind of stuff. Why did you take on these various roles? Why, why have you deemed that to be important? And how has that helped you? Obviously, in your job hunt, it's helped you, but how has it helped you become a better football coach? To answer the question as to why I am so versatile and so willing to take on such a diverse array of experiences is such. I will give you a short answer, and then I will give you a long answer. The short answer is this. Do you want to coach football or not? Right. Now, here's a long answer to the question. You expand your opportunities if you have an expansive skill set. I want to start by focusing on my football coaching journey. On the field, I have had the following experiences on the field. I played wide receiver in high school, so I've been a wide receiver's coach. I played running back in college, so I've been a running back's coach. On top of that, however, I have also been a quarterback's coach. I've been a defensive back's coach. I have been a special teams coordinator. I've been an offensive coordinator. And I currently am a special teams coach, focusing primarily on the specialists, kickers, punters, and long snappers. Folks, do you want to coach football or not? There may be a program out there that has your eye for a variety of reasons. Maybe it's, it's location or the people that you will have the opportunity to work with. Or maybe you have a personal connection to that program. If you played running back in college, for example, and that program already has a running backs coach, and you tell the head coach, running backs, it's all I do, and it's all I know. You ain't going to have a job. It's not going to work. But if the head coach says, 
I currently have a running backs coach. He's a longtime member of our staff. But I am looking for a defensive line coach. Would you be willing to coach defensive line? I come back to my question to everyone who may find themselves in that situation. Do you want to coach football or not? (laughs) So, I have coached just about every single position on the field. If you want to be on a head coaching track, and I do have some head coaching ambitions in me, but right now I'm very, very, very happy with my current coaching situation. If you want to be a head football coach someday, it would behoove you to know a little bit about all the positions on the field so you know what is going on so that you can provide adequate oversight for all of your assistants and help out wherever is needed. You have to be a football guy. You can't just be a running backs guy or a linebackers guy or an offensive guy or a defensive guy. You have to be a football guy. Let's move on to strength and conditioning. I am a certified strength and conditioning specialist with a distinction with the National Strength and Conditioning Association. I know that is a mouthful, but for the uninitiated, the NSCA is the premier professional association in the sports and fitness industry for strength and conditioning coaches of all levels. The CSCS is the gold standard for strength coaching certifications. I have a CSCS with distinction. I also serve as the Maryland State Director for the National Strength and Conditioning Association. It's also my outlet to give back to the strength coaching profession here in Maryland. If you can work in the weight room competently, with excellence, you also expand your opportunities to coach football, to make yourself useful to a program, to add value. And in the early days of my high school football coaching career, I did have some ambitions of trying to return to the college game if the right opportunity presented itself. And in my mind back then, in my early days of high school football coaching, I thought that being able to be a high quality sport coach on the field and being able to be an excellent strength coach in the weight room would provide me with two different pathways to the college football game. I have learned over the years that I really, really, really like coaching at the high school level. So my ideas about coaching college football have been on the back burner for quite some time. But high school is where I feel called to be right now, and I am having a blast coaching at the high school level. Because if you coach college football, there is one thing in college football that you can't do. I would actually break it down and say two different things. You can't coach girl sports, and you can't coach multiple sports. They're interrelated. So I provide that as a segue to this other fact that I am coaching multiple sports, and I also am coaching girls' sports. As Mario has mentioned, I have coached a number of other sports. I've coached boys' basketball, girls' swimming. I currently coach girls' varsity ice hockey at Archbishop Spalding High School. And I would tell all young coaches that if there is one thing that you can do professionally, to significantly improve your skills as a football coach. I would tell folks this. Coach multiple sports and coach girl sports, especially if those multiple sports become part of your repertoire. Coaching multiple sports will help you be a better football coach. Just like how we tell our football players that being a multi-sport athlete will help them be a better football player. What you learn in other sports, the coaching cues that you develop to help athletes achieve certain tasks, the relationships you build with those athletes, 
the knowledge that you gain from other sports are transferable back to football. And I will add that if those other sports that you coach outside of football happen to be girl sports, you also have the great benefit of developing and enhancing your communication and connection skills. I don't coach girls any differently from the way I coach boys. But we all know that there's a different way to communicate and connect with girls. And I have found that being able to improve and enhance my ability to communicate and connect with athletes as a girl sport coach translates 100% onto the football field and makes me a better football coach. And the better football coach I am, the better girls sport coach I am. It is a self-feeding cycle. And that's what really excites me about the high school game because when you coach high school football, you are allowed to coach multiple sports and you are allowed to coach girls sports. So I'm having an awesome time. I'm learning every single day. Granted, the other sports that I coach outside of football are not sports that I have an extensive playing background in nor as expense, ex- extensive and expertise in. However, I still serve with competence and with excellence because at the end of the day, if you want to be a great coach, it's actually not about being able to play the game at an elite level. That certainly helps. I will always tell folks that if you've been a college athlete or better in the particular sport that you coach, that is a tremendous asset that you can use to inspire, influence, and impact athletes if you know how to use that experience to inspire, influence, and impact athletes. I have seen former college athletes not be able to take their own experiences and translate it on the field in a way that connects with athletes. The big things are this. Are you enthusiastic about your job, number one? And number two, do you have a willingness to learn? If you're enthusiastic about your job, and if you are willing to learn, I can make you a great coach. I can make you a great coach if you are enthusiastic about your job and you have a willingness to learn. Every coach out there who aspires to be a head coach should have a private list of potential hires. You should always have a group of people in mind that you will reach out to and ask if they would be willing to join you on staff because these people are people you know, like, and trust and are great fits in your system and philosophy. In my prospective list of assistant coaches for my head coaching packet, I actually have a handful of women listed in my potential staff, mainly because I know these highly qualified, knowledgeable women in the strength and conditioning industry. I know their athletic background. I've communicated with them. We've collaborated on projects in the strength and conditioning world. And I know that they're enthusiastic about their job. I know of their willingness to learn. And if you're enthusiastic about your job and you're willing to learn, I can make you a great football coach. Just like how I played running back in college, but I'm currently a special teams coach. I I didn't play kicker, punter, or long snapper in college. Yet, I was very enthusiastic about the role I was taking on, and I had a willingness to learn. I will reiterate this one more time for the audience because this is very important. If you have enthusiasm for your job, and if you are willing to learn, you can be a great coach. Coach Tran, that's a great end point right there. I, I appreciate you, uh, you know, dropping some some knowledge bombs for us. I appreciate your passion, um, your your dedication to our young athletes, and and, and pouring into them, and um, you know all the great things that you do for our association as well. But before I let you go, I I'm in encouraging uh, everybody to keep up with with coach trans amazing journey um 
could you please share your social media, your Twitter account, just so coaches can connect with you if they have questions about the podcast. I know there was some, some other stuff I want to dive into with you, but uh, as we kind of ran out of time here, I'd love for coaches to be able to connect with you and ask you more questions, man. You can find me on the internet at all major social media platforms at Phil Tran 22, P H I L T R A N 22. I'm on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, YouTube. Please like, follow, subscribe. I would be very happy to get in touch with you all. If any of you are ever in the DC area, feel free to contact me directly. We'll try to make some time to talk shop. All right, Phil. Well, once again, I appreciate your sick and bears and I uh, look forward to connecting with you at the next convention, man. Yes, sir. Thank you for having me on the program. I greatly appreciate it.